uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm saying that to the Facebook people, already said hello to everybody else. Um, I hope you're safe somewhere. I assume some of you might be on holidays and dialing in that way. Um, we're going to do something a little bit different today because we're going to have our uh, Lord's Table, the communion celebration of the Lord's Table after our sermon today. So we'll probably turn off from there uh, for you guys in Facebook land. But um, yeah, well, that's where we're heading uh, today. Now what I wanted to just quickly elaborate on is looking at the Passover and, and Christ Jesus and then the Lord's Table make some connection there for us. Uh, before I do that, I might just pr open in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. Thanks for the music uh, that we heard. Uh, we thank you for um, the scriptures. And Lord, particularly as we start to connect uh, the Passover and the Passover lamb and the final Passover lamb, Christ Jesus, Lord, uh, may that enrich our own lives and our own sense of wonder and glory uh, for who you are and what you've done for us. So please bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Well, look, what we'll be doing is uh, I'll do a recap on the Passover, just the, the original Passover. I'm not going to get into the details of more of the laws that were laid out and, and what happened there, but just to connect that. Um, and I'm going to apply some elements of that along the way as well. And then I'm going to uh, share with you or, 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 or get us to focus on Christ Jesus, the final Passover lamb. And even connect some scripture um, with uh, so New Testament scripture about Christ and how that fulfilled in many respects or completed or aligned to the Passover itself in the Old Testament. And then uh, bring this, those thoughts, all of those thoughts into what it means for us uh, as we celebrate the Lord's table. Now, uh, Noel has already um, <clears throat> read from Exodus 12, so you might want to go back there and put your finger in the passage there and uh, by the end of our cert, the time together through the sermon itself we'll end up in Hebrews uh, as well but for most of it uh, we'll be looking at Exodus 12 and reflecting from there now Exodus 12 this is the historical account of that first Passover and much of this wonderful narrative is really about the redemption and salvation of God's people bringing them back to God. We see that's a progressive thing in that sense. They're God's people, uh, but we see that when God saves them, then he gives them a law to follow uh, out Mount Sinai. And, and literally, he saves them through water, we might say. But even here, to this night, back in Exodus 12, he is doing that. So as we think about the Israelites in Egypt, I want you to think also about your own salvation. Direct your thoughts that way. How is my journey... Uh, and what God has taken me through and saved me from. How is that similar to the account we get here in um, Exodus 12? And we could even say in some respects, we think particularly about the shed blood of the lamb, we might say. That started with Adam and Eve, didn't it? This shedding of blood. Uh, Adam and Eve sinned there in Genesis, the early few chapters. Um, and then they realised that they had sinned. They realised that they were naked before God. And they sowed fig leaves together in uh, verse 7 of chapter 3. And then God, later on in that same chapter, in 20 or 21, gives them animal skin. Um, so the blood has been shed. This is what God requires. Now that sin has entered the world, now that they've contravened what God had put in place, uh, and thus death will uh, come upon them, God shows that what is required is the killing of another part of his creation. It sounds awful. And the blood must be shed in that sense. So death must be conquered. Sins must be atoned for with another life, with the blood of a living sacrifice. We even see that example, don't we, with Cain and Abel as well, uh, where Cain's sacrifice of vegetables was not uh, considered appropriate. We see in Genesis 15, if we follow Genesis through there, <clears throat> this theme of blood again, where uh, God makes a covenant with Abraham and God actually required. God actually sheds blood to confirm that covenant. So this is an important element, uh, an important theme, we might say, in Scripture. And really, for us in our sophisticated Western countries, it's a bit... It, we've grown up in it, but it, it can be quite weird, I think, or, or strange for people to try and comprehend that. And particularly if you come from a culture 
not, not just our secular culture, but even a culture where um, have, eating, you know, uh, eating meat or uh, a culture where you consider all creation, all, all animals, um, you know, not to be killed that way unless it's for food. And here we have these sacrifices being made. But that shows the extent and the depth of what God required uh, and the extent and the depth of where man had gone through Adam in their sin. And then as we come up to um, our our time in uh, Exodus 12 there, we know, if you know the, the, the account, there's been nine plagues so far, plague after plague, which probably took about six months, um, all things given that you know some of the crops that had grown and then been destroyed would have taken a bit, etc. You can work that out yourself. It doesn't really matter. Um, <clears throat> but you can see the ten slides up there, ten plagues on the slides there. Um, uh, with the blood in the river, the frogs, gnats, flies, livestock, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and then as we'll see shortly, the firstborn. <laughs> what an awful trail. What a devastation. We're, we're sort of freaked out about a pandemic, aren't we? <laughs> Which isn't really like one of these things here. Um, and so certainly it was a horrendous time there. And I, I, I'm interested in, for me, I'm interested, and I want you to be as well, in that ninth plague, the darkness, which was for three days. Um, and I think, I think in some respects symbolises the awful darkness of death that is about to come upon Egypt. And, I, you, you know, if you, if you like to sort of draw parallels, the scripture is a beautiful masterpiece. We consider the three hours that Jesus spent in darkness uh, before his death. Yet Jesus rose again. And so we see with the Israelites, after this darkness, after the death of the firstborn, Christ then, uh, oh, sorry, Christ. <laughs> well, God, Yahweh, we might say, took them. Technically, you could say Christ as well. Uh, took them and redeemed them uh, out of Egypt. And really, I think that's just a, a just an aside to consider. So sins must be atoned for. Death must be conquered with the blood of a living sacrifice. I want you to fast forward now to, uh, just keep your finger on Exodus 12, uh, Exodus 24, Um they're, they're out of Egypt now. Exodus 24, verse 7 to 8. Then, <clears throat> then Moses took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. And they were making these uh, sacrifices before then. And then Moses took the blood. Listen to this. He sprinkled it on the people. So he's already done it elsewhere. He said, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. So he's already sprinkled with some on the altar. Um, the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made recording. So here, Moses representing Yahweh, representing God, is showing them that this blood is important. Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made in accordance with you. And I would imagine that blood being sprinkled upon them will be something they would never forget. Though if we know the history of the Israelites in the wilderness, they did forget God's goodness and mercy. They did forget the covenant that God had made, but certainly that impression or that experience uh, must have been there. We then come, if we come back to Exodus uh, um, uh, uh, 11, this death of the first, we're going to be in 12, but the death of the firstborn is announced. Uh, we know that none of Israel is going to be killed as long as they followed the instructions. The blood of the lamb had to be shed and um, it had to be an unblemished lamb, didn't it? And it's ironic if we could say this, it was the firstborn that was to die. And Jesus has been described as the firstborn. Now we know the, the Greek is, prob is, is, is saying the first rank. But I, I just love, again, that, um, that, that parallel that is there. Let's have a look at Exodus 12, 1 to 13. Um, now, Will's already read it, so we'll just work through some of the elements here. Um, in verse 7 and 13, um, we see that the blood... Uh, had to be placed from the lamb on the doorpost and the lintel, okay? And if that blood was not there, um, uh, and, and the angel would pass over them if it was there. But if it was not there, death would uh, uh, follow. We see the bitter herbs there, a uh, reminder of slavery and suffering and sin. They're in a land that's not their own. And remember, they also worshipped other gods at this point, it would appear, because I've told to remove their idols as well. Um, but certainly this tradition that then followed, this commemoration 
uh, of the Passover. The, the bitter herbs were to remind them of where they once were. Imagine asking people, like, like we've got this, uh, um, this dinner coming up soon, and uh, if you imagine if the host starts serving you bitter herbs or, or horrible things, this is they're celebrating once a year, but it's to remind them of slavery and suffering and sin. Really remind them of where they were without God. The unleavened bread, there was no time for this bread to rise. And um, uh, we see there that this is part now of the tradition, the commemoration that they do, that they're to have unleavened bread uh, there as well. We also see the lamb, all of the lamb has to be consumed and um, not a bone of the lamb was to be broken in verse 46. What do you think of when you read that? <laughs> yeah, well, we know. We think of Christ, don't we? It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. All of it must be consumed. In many respects, we could say the same, that Christ was fully consumed uh, on the cross. And I don't know if you picked this up in verse 11. And thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, so you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So they're ready to go. They've got their things packed and they're ready to go, dressed ready to go. And that was what they were supposed to do. But by the time of Jesus' time, as you, if you recall there, when he uh, starts the, the, the Passover there, they're reclining uh, around low tables and all that sort of stuff. It become a more relaxed affair. But the, 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 the tradition was that remember what it was like so the generations till the next generation, till the next generation, till the next generation, um, they, they were ready to go. And I don't know, I, I don't know. I mean, they've had nine plagues. Pharaoh keeps saying, yes, no, yes, no, 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 yes, no. And now, <clears throat> I don't know, can you imagine this? I would imagine Moses now would have been in a relative's place there. Already the lamb had been slain at twilight. The blood was painted on the door side with a bunch of hyssop. Uh, the lamb had been roasted, not boiled. Don't know what the children were thinking in and around that. I don't know if there was a distance floating around of what they did or saw. Uh, but they would also told to pack up and get ready. Uh, Travelling clothes girded up, it says. Uh, walking staffs in hand. Much like you'd be waiting at an airport. If you go to the airport, you're all ready to go. And you, you start to see the air hostesses and air stewards get there, get open the doors and all that, and people get up and they're ready. And that's how they were standing, ready as they partook of this meal. Donkeys and camels, whatever else they had. They're all packed, ready to go. And in some respects, this is it. This would have been exciting for Moses and Aaron. Perhaps a lot of the others didn't realise, or would Pharaoh push back again? It might be exciting, but it might be scary. Is he going to run the army in? He's changed his mind a few times, but we've got to follow uh, what uh, Moses has told us through um, and what God has told him. Uh, but God, in 11.1, in uh, the Lord said to Moses, I will bring... One more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out of here altogether. He's going to be really mad and furious. So every Israelite participates in the first Passover. They eat the lamb, the bitter herbs, the unleavened bread, and they wait and wait. Again, perhaps nervous, quite anticipation, in silence. It would have been quite a, 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 an interesting experience or feeling to consider. I don't know about Moses at this point. He has been talking to God directly. He has seen part of the glory of God in the sense of the burning bush. And, and one day we'll see even more than that, but never God himself. I wonder if he's reflecting on his redemption story. He was in the ark. Floating in the basket there on the river when the princess found him. He might be thinking back about his murderous act with the Egyptians. How grateful he would feel now um, after 80 years of living on the planet and then he finally fulfills God's purposes that God enabled him to do. Uh, but then that murder at 40 years of age must have been something quite significant, something that probably hounded him. But now he can see God working all things together for good. All things together. Looks back, it's such a picture of grace, isn't it? And likewise, as we partake of the Passover, uh, sorry, the Lord's table, we reflect, don't we? We reflect on where God has brought us from and where he is taking us to. We confess our sin. We confess our unworthiness. We celebrate 
our thankfulness of what he has done for us. And in this point in the, in the, in the narrative, they're anticipating that. Uh, but for us, we don't anticipate. We look back, don't we, to what Christ has done. And that's why we don't want to do this ceremony we've got, this solemn um, time together in an unworthy manner. It's almost, well, it is blasphemy to do so. If you're in habitual sin, for example, and then you're saying, you're, you're celebrating what Christ has done for you with the shed blood and, and, and the bread, and yet you're living in sin, you're almost making a mockery. Well, you are making a mockery of what Christ has done. But back to Moses, he waits, like all of Israel, he waits for midnight on that call from Pharaoh. I'm not sure how they would have identified that. Um, I guess the Pharaoh knew where he lived, or where he was staying. And, and in some respects, we wait. Again, not for salvation, but we wait for the return of Christ, don't we? So we look back to what he has done, and yet we anticipate, like Moses does, we anticipate the return of Christ. I think that's just an exciting concept to think about. Well, we see that Pharaoh does let God's people go. But we really know it's all of God, don't we? Let me just read that in Exodus 12. I'm jumping ahead here. 39, uh, no, 29 to 36. And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he, all his servants, and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Can you believe that? Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise, go out from among my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. So it's not believing God. He might at this initial point, I guess. But he asked for blessing. And the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land in haste, for they said, We shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, having their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes on their shoulders. Now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, and they had asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favour in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they granted them what they requested. Listen to this last line. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. Verse 37 says there were 600,000 men besides children, women, etc. So this is a significant... That's why they think there's probably about 2 million uh, people that left. What has happened here? Egypt has been completely devastated, haven't they? If you consider those 10 plagues, agriculturally, economically, spiritually, morally, they're, they're destitute um, in, uh, and um, their morale is completely bankrupt. Uh, they're giving them gold and say, get out of here, go before we all die. And I would imagine there would have been a lot of unrest before then, after the first two or three or four plagues, and the Egyptian people are saying, why doesn't Pharaoh just, they're killing us here, we've got to do something. We complain about the government doing more of what's going on right now. Could you imagine this situation? And soon we'll see, we'll not see today, but soon we will see if we follow the story that the army themselves are destroyed. The majority of the army in the Red Sea there. So they're completely devastated. And you now I love this little, uh, this sort of quirky sort of line here that Moses was once found in a basket case, wasn't he? <laughs> but now Egypt is a basket case. They are completely messed up and devastated, devastatingly destroyed, we might say. And really, there's a nice little. Um, take out for us there, isn't it? That those who continue to reject God, despite all the signs, despite all the evidence, despite truth, will suffer the consequences of that rejection. So in that sense, we need to look back. And that's what we do at the Lord. So we look back and we see that where we would be without God, we would be a basket case as well. The world is a basket case right now, isn't it? And we're seeing that become very, very obvious now. 
So as we celebrate the Lord's table, we need to see that our sin has been smashed. Praise the Lord for that. Our sin against others, our sin against God, things that were done to us have all been washed white as snow. We can live in Christ because why? We are in Christ. He sacrificed. He's once for all, as we'll see in Hebrews, sacrifice has made that possible. So we do see here uh, that Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. And in there, in, in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, 8, the, the real section there says, for indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Then it goes on to talk about, Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And we know that the leaven is often mentioned in the New Testament, isn't it? Um, and indeed, Scripture uh, that about sin and that it spreads. Sometimes people use the example now of cancer as it spreads. Sin in your life impacts all parts of your life. And if you don't get a hold of it, it will destroy your life. And that's what I love about the bitter herbs there, the Israelites reminding that, reminded them of the bitterness of slavery. And that taste would have been really brutal in their mouth. And they were told to teach their kids, weren't they? I can't imagine that impression when you, I don't know what age your kids will start doing this, but to give them that and say, you've got to eat this. It's horrible. You've got to eat this. Let me tell you why. This reminds all of us of what we were saved from. This reminds all of us what we were saved from. I think I've shared this before, but I grew up in an era where if you told a lie, your mum would wash your mouth out with soap to teach you a lesson. Might be considered domestic violence or something now. I don't know. But these bitter herbs that they took reminded them of where they'd come from. And for us, if we take that analogy, it reminds us of our sin and the consequences of being trapped or enslaved to sin. We know that scriptures teach us that we are trapped in our sin. We're unable to make a difference unless God intervenes in our life, just as he did with the Israelites. So the Passover points to Jesus, doesn't it? I'm not sure how easy that is to read, but I'm going to refer to these particular passages here. We see, firstly, if we go back to the lamb that needed to be selected, it had some things that were important. To, in some respects, demonstrate the holiness and the standard that God had in place for this sacrifice. And as we know, these sacrifices are a foreshadowing of Christ. And Hebrews does that really well to show those connections. We see that it must be without blemish or defect. We read down the bottom of 1 Peter 1 or verse 19, that like that of the lamb without blemish or spot. In Hebrews, uh, sorry, Exodus 12, 5, we read the same thing there. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Or so read that the no bone was to be broken. Uh, Exodus 12, 46 says that. But we read in John 19, Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who was crucified with him. They wanted to speed up the process because they were told to. They come up there, they break the bones of the guy on the left and on the right. Um, and then they come to Christ. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. Underlined, I've got here, they did not break his legs. They did not break his legs. And he has seen us testify, and his testimony is true. This is John speaking. And he knows that he's telling the truth, so that you may believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And that's picking up Psalm 34 in particular. Jesus is the final Passover. Without blemish, without defect. No bone was broken. And then we see this uh, the concept, this this principle that the shed blood of the Lamb saves. In verse 19 of 1 Peter 1, it says that we're not saved in verse 18 with perishable things such as silver and gold. In other words, you can't buy your way into glory. You can't buy your way into favour with God. But with the precious blood of Christ. Revelation 5 says, verse 9, they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seal, for you are slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood and out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation just as we heard 
uh, that song that Noel picked at the start with Across the Land. How beautiful is that? The shed blood of God is bringing people from every nation, every tribe. So even back then, well, we look back through Scripture and we see this first night here of the Passover where God is about to save his physical people, Israel, out of slavery. We can see Christ, can't we? We can see Christ. It points to Christ. And John the Baptist, he saw that early on, didn't he? He says, behold, the Lamb of God, in John 1, 29, that takes away the sin of the world, the Lamb of God. He takes away the sin. He is the Passover lamb. And he was silent before his accusers. In his death, he bore the wrath of God, didn't he? And he gave freedom to former slaves of sin, which is you and me. We were enslaved in sin. We were stuck in sin. Just like the Israelites in Egypt were stuck in their sin. I think it's a beautiful moment. A beautiful imagery to think about. Jesus at the last Passover, we might say. And Jesus is the Lamb of God. And he's sitting there with his disciples and he's eating the Passover. And he started that that, that ceremony. And it becomes, as we know, the last lamb. It becomes that sacrificial last lamb for us. Soak it up for a moment. This is Jesus, Son of God. This is Jesus, Son of God, holy. This is Jesus, Son of God, pure and sinless. He has come to earth. He suffers, he dies, he rises, you and me. He was made sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. That quote is probably hard to read on the screen, but I want to read it to you. This is a great quote by John Owen, and I'm going to read some uh, some scripture as well. Well, through that. John Owen says... Think about this, guys. How many millions of sins in every one of the elect every one of which is enough to condemn them all, has this love overcome. What mountains of unbelief does it remove? Look upon the conduct of any one saint. Consider the frame of his heart. See the many stains and spots, the defilements and infirmities with which his life is contaminated. And tell me whether the love that bears with all this is not to be admired. This is the love of Christ. And is not the same... And is this not the same towards thousands every day? What streams of grace, purging, pardoning, quickening, assisting do flow from it every day? And then John Allen finishes with, This is how beloved. The love of Christ has done that for us. The love of Christ has done that for us. Let me just you, work through these with you. Soak them up, please. John 3, 6, and we know that, don't we? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, should not perish, but have everlasting love. We know that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The wages of reject Pharaoh's wages of rejecting God and his people was devastation. Destruction. But for the Israelites, it meant... Entering at some point in the future the promised land. 1 John 2 1 2 says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is our propitiation for our sins. That means he has he has satisfied the punishment and wrath that God had for us. He has satisfied that and at the same time reconciled us back. But not for ours only, but also for the whole world, i.e. anyone who places their faith in Christ. Right, and we see that in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you go back to Jesus' time for a moment. At Passover, there's always, if you read textbooks, I'll tell you there were so many killed at any one time but Josephus in writing about 66 to 70 uh, we might call AD um, he recorded 256,500 lambs each year on that Passover were killed that's amazing isn't it that's a lot of sheep 
that's why they estimate because they would do that for fa- you had to had to be for family or, a lo- or if you couldn't eat it all f- more families together it could be millions would have been millions in and around in Jerusalem even at the time of Jesus and these lambs unbeknownst to them some have been raised tenderly and they had to be perfect and looked after and a lot of were bought because they didn't want to damage it on the way to get into Jerusalem so they were buying in Jerusalem and they were like sheep being led to the slaughter hundreds of thousands of them and yet Christ also was like a sheep to the slaughter wasn't he? he was oppressed he was afflicted Isaiah 53 says he's like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before it shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Jesus, our sacrificial lamb, whilst he was quiet though, he had a conscious decision to make and he followed the will of the Father, didn't he? He wasn't like these lambs who were just doing, following the next lamb in front of him, unbeknown to what was happening. Our sacrificial lamb knew exactly what was going on. And I want to finish... Uh, Come with me to Hebrews 9. I want to read a a chunk of a passage there. Hebrews 9. But when Christ... I want to try and bring this together. I want to try and bring the Passover, that first one, what that meant for the Israelites and God fulfilling his promises to them, and then think about Christ being the fulfilment of that land. And, 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 and you'll see the analogy here that bounces really. This elevates that thinking from the lamb to, to being the high priest as well. Verse 11, Hebrews 9, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, i.e. not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, Not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For the priest would go in and atone for his own sins and then bring in the others. Uh, Bring in the other sacrifices to atone for the people. That had to be done year after year. But here Jesus Christ, high priest, secures an eternal redemption because he's the eternal God. For the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling, so back to the verse, of defiled person of the ashes of a heifer sanctifies the purification of the flesh. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without blemish to God? How much will that purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, Jesus Christ is the mediator, I'll put that word in just, of a new covenant. So those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, not just a physical promised land, since a death occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under that first covenant. Let me go down to verse 19. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats of water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. So everything was covered in the blood. The book, the utensils that were used, the people, everything needed to be covered uh, to, to be acceptable to God and his holy standard. Imagine if we had to do that today. Verse 22, indeed, the, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Some of your translations might say no remission of sins. And this isn't just to confirm the covenant like God did with Abraham in Genesis 15. This is to, to grant forgiveness and grant life, we might say. So we see it goes on there in verse 23. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into the holy places made with hands, i.e. man, which are copies of the true things, or foreshadowing of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor does he have to it says in verse 12, offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own, 
So the high priest says, can't even bring in his own blood. It must be the blood of the, he- of the bull, uh, if you recall our time in Deuteronomy. But then he would have to offer, have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared, this is Jesus, once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after this, the judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to do with sin, but to save those who eagerly are waiting for him. Now that word save is talking not about salvation, but to bring everything, to culminate. We call the consummation of all things. How beautiful will that be? So in a nutshell, that's a long passage and there's a lot in there, but the eternal, sinless Son of God, our high priest, makes the last sacrifice, propitiates our sin, makes us right with God, so he atones for our sin and continues to sustain us and continues to keep us because he is the eternal Son of God. If I asked you to reflect in your Christian life right now and how you feel it's been going over the years, you would find there's ups and downs, yeah? And sometimes when there's downs, we beat ourselves up a bit and think, man, I just can't do it. But Christ did. He is the one who sustains you. And that's why the Lord's table is such a special observance for us to consider. Israel were commanded to keep the Passover, weren't they? And as we know, till Christ fulfilled that. Now we are commanded, as along with baptism we might say, to commemorate what Christ has done for us. Yes, he did die for you. It is only through Christ Jesus. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, he says, we preach Christ crucified. And in further on, in the second chapter, he says, I want you to know nothing else but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because he bore our sins on the tree. And we have gained favour with God, not because of ourselves, but because of what God has done. It's because Christ took our sin. Even while, Romans 5, 8 says, we were still in our sin, Christ died for us. Isn't that good? That should be such a blessing to consider. I don't know, sometimes we hear that a lot, but I think it's important for us to see that. And I think the significance too, if it was just that Jesus turned up and said, I'm going to die for the sins of the people, we might think, yeah, that's good. But when you start to delve into the history Even go back to Genesis, that the blood was shed there to cover the nakedness, to cover the sin of Adam and Eve in that sense. And then to follow that history there and see that all this is building and culminating and and navigating towards and God is sovereignly, providentially working all those things so that Christ the sinless one would come and die for us. It just gives such a depth to it. And then as we sit before the Lord's table, Today, we need to contemplate where we were before Christ. Did that work in our lives? We're going to have communion together now. Let me just close in prayer uh, for those who are on Facebook who will leave. Um, and then we'll, we'll do communion together. Father, we thank you for this time. Father, we thank you for this uh, command that you've given us to to formally celebrate and remember what Christ has done. His blood for us. His body for us. We're enslaved in sin and yet we have been saved because you, Father, are rich in mercy. You, Father, have great love and grace. And you fulfil all things through Christ and we thank you for that, Lord. So please bless this time as we come before uh, these elements, Lord that uh, help us remember what you have done for us through Christ. In Jesus' name.